And we're live. Welcome to the H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast Roundtable. Topic this week is H.P. Lovecraft's literary influence. I am joined with my co-host, as always, Chad Pfeiffer. Hello, everybody. Glad to be and here. And we, we have two guests so far. Hopefully, We're supposed to have four guests in total, but uh, they, we're having either technical problems or we don't know exactly what's going on, so hopefully they'll jump on uh, when they can become available. Um, but I'd like to introduce first uh, Patrick. Hey, how's it going? Um, just a writer with interest in Lovecraft uh, and some aspirations towards writing, uh, you know, short fiction, that sort of thing. That was my bag in college, but, you know, corporate stuff, you got to uh, pay the bills. Perhaps we'll get into Lovecraft's method of paying the bills, but uh, <laughs> that's me. Starving. <laughs> Starving to death. Yeah, that's how we paid the bills. And uh, also, we're joined uh, by Mark. Hey there, I'm Mark Martin, and I'm an associate professor of biology at the University of Puget Sound, but in my previous life I used to write science fiction and ghost stories. I actually got paid for it a couple of times, which was nice. Nice. Um, so I've always loved HPL, and I certainly love science, and I like the way that those two things interact with one another. So I'm delighted to be here, because I'm a big fan of the show. Yeah. That's well, awesome. Well, we're gonna, I'll get started right away. I, there, this is basically not just talking about what has influenced Love, Lovecraft, but how he has influenced modern literature or literature over the last uh, 80 years. So starting off with Lovecraft's early part of his career, he was really fascinated with weird fiction. And I wonder what it was about the works that he read that really got him excited. What was it, do you think, that was so appealing to H.P. Lovecraft about weird fiction. And I'm going to throw that to Mark. Well, I, I have a theory about that. I was <laughs> first introduced to H.P.L. when I was very young by my brother. Mad props to Jack. And the fact of the matter is, is H.P. Lovecraft had a very unusual childhood. He was clearly thought to be super strange. How much better do you feel about yourself when there's something far, far stranger out there? And I think that that helped him feel better about himself. Note also the language he's used from the time he was quite young, which was exclusionary toward everybody else. So I think the idea of something larger and more vast and uncaring made him feel in some ways more like a hero. I can see that, yeah. Uh, Patrick? Yeah, well, mostly I would point to, you know, his own accounts and, you know, uh, other biographers, you know, his interest in first, like, Greek gods and stuff like that, you know, Pan in particular being a... Yeah. Uh, large influence, uh, the goat guy in the woods, and you know his. I guess from an early age he was very precocious, and he was maybe perhaps a little strange, but also very precocious. Um, you know, he he printed his own paper. He would take out ads and you know do stuff for people. Um, you know, it, it advertised his services basically as a writer, and you know he had all the hard marks of being somebody you know uh, really cool. Um, uh, not that he wasn't. And Joshi, you know, sort of talks a bit about how sort of the path he was going then was sort of towards a professorship sort of deal um, at Brown University, maybe. But uh, 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 things changed for him, I guess, in school. And um, that sort of sort that sort of downtrodden areas what led him to, uh, I guess, sort of adopt a different kind of writing than. Uh, uh, what was the norm? Hey, Ch Chad, do you have any thoughts on it? Well, I, I, why Lovecraft was so enamored of weird fiction? Um, yeah. I, you know, I think these guys are on the right path. I think it has a lot to do with his childhood. He seemed like growing up that he was somebody who was very involved in his imaginary life and his in uh, the worlds of the fantastic that he could create. However, because of his his intellect. He quickly was a rationalist and quickly was an atheist, I mean, even before he was 10. And so I think that he was fascinated by things that pushed it to the realm, you know, pushed as far as it could into uh, the unbelievable, but still left it unexplained. <clears throat> so that he was able to reconcile what he loved, which was mythology and creativity and imagination, and, you know, be able to also live as a rationalist. Because weird fiction, it just says, we don't know what happened. Something crazy out there went went down, and those are the things that he was attracted to the most. 
I think one more thing maybe to add to, to this pot of reasons, I guess, is his uh, interest in dreams, I guess. I, I don't know what your guys' experience with dreams have. I've never been, you know, blessed with fantastical dreams of uh, far away, colossal, titanic uh, uh, landscapes, but uh, it seems what, whatever what he was experiencing was very important to him, and he, he was trying to find a way to express this in terms that other people could understand and could also invoke the same you know, emotional reaction that he had when experiencing these things. And that was something that was shared by his wife, I think, and a lot of his friends in the literary circles, that sort of thing, trying to figure out what motivates these dreams, not really uh, what motivates these dreams, but more like how to express those ideas in a way that other people could understand and also to generate the same feeling. I, th I think that's straight up. When, when I was in college, I had a chance to talk to Fritz Leiber, who'd actually corresponded and knew HPL a little bit. Yeah. And this is just straight up kind of the way he was talking about him. Now, Leiber was very old at the time. And if you ever read his stuff, it's quite influenced by HPL, and it's not a surprise. It's quite interesting. But I, I would also add to, this, to the mix that he very clearly had issues involving, for lack of a better term, genetics. And this had to do with his mother and father's, father's insanity, his mother's insanity. And this is a thread that runs through a lot of his more personal, um, I don't know, you know, you can call some of his stuff science fiction and some of it not, but I, I would say that in a lot of his, a lot of his fiction, Arthur German comes to mind, that you, you have this whole idea of the, the hidden ancestry, which is evil, that you have to overcome or give into, for that matter. And I think that that is, that is what drove him as well and made him feel like an outsider even more. Interesting that one of his most famous stories has that title. But, I mean, it's also, like you were talking, it's Arthur, not just Arthur German, it's uh, uh, Rats in the Walls, it's uh, Shadows Over Innsmouth, it's Call Cthulhu. Uh, The Lurking Fear, the, you know, that, that there's something in the, the, the person's past. And, uh, and yeah, and I think that, that might have something to do with it. And... But, I, you know, Chad, I think Chad's, I, I have to agree with Pfeiffer uh, on your point, just saying that that being a hard rationalist, this was the stuff that scared him or got his um, fantastic buttons tickled. You know, oh, like absolutely. That was what... I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I mean, and, and the idea of being a very small insect in a vast and uncaring universe I mean, this is absolutely at his core in, in almost anything that he wrote. If you've had a chance to read Charlie Strauss's The Atrocity Archive series, mm -hmm. you get a lot of that done with kind of a James Bond twist. Yeah. That, you know, there, or as he put it, there is a god and you don't want him to come back. <laughs> right. Because what they mean is a big supernatural style entity, right? Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, what HBL was writing about were not supernatural entities at all, but they were vast and unknowing intelligences to borrow from H.G. Wells. Right. And uh, that's kind of what I think was, was driving him as well. Absolutely a rationalist at an early age. And how frightening for a little kid to deal with that in a big old house with a, with a dad who was dying of syphilis. Yeah. Yeah. But I do think it's interesting that you guys are talking about the lineage issue. Because that, to me, seems like a uniquely Lovecraftian tick, at least in my small exposure to the things that he had in his library that we've been covering on the show. You do see some, uh, you know abhorrent lineages, say, in The Great God Pan or something like that, where the woman has a child who then goes on to wreck havoc because she's related to, you know, essentially unbridled nature. But for the most part, you don't see the presence of these long... Le well, maybe in The Dead Smile you do as well. But they're very short-lived things, whereas with Lovecraft, it's a very old illness that has racked a family that eventually will come back. And that illness could just be you're related to gorillas or... Um, you're related to fish or whatever it happens to be, but it's his his take on the, the the horrors of evolution that he you know believed in, but also you know that was something that I think was unique to Lovecraft that he superimposed over this, you know because a lot of these stories we read that he was looking at, it's a little eye opening to realize that a lot of his work is just a pa pastiche of that stuff, you know he's just sort of recreating effects that were present in Blackwood and Mackin and. Chambers and a lot of other these writers that he admired, but certainly his own paranoias and proclivities were layered over that to create the, the tapestry that we all like so much. But don't you find an essential tension? Here's his his ancestry he can't help and he has to fight it, but then he may give in. Right. And that's what happens in a lot of the fiction that he writes. That he has to struggle, sure. and then he embraces it. 
Yeah, and I think, you know, if you look at uh, Rats in the Walls versus uh, Shadow over Innsmouth, in the end of Rats in the Walls, the man descends into cannibalism, and it's not a pretty sight. Whereas at the end of Shadows over Innsmouth, it's arguable that that's a happy ending. Yeah. I mean, he does get to go off and swim and be with his, you know, his relatives and his grandma. Be immortal. His great, great, great grandma. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, maybe if you, maybe there was a PS that we just never got on at the end of Rats in the Walls, where he's like, you know, that meal was pretty darn good, and that had a happy ending too. I don't know. And that takes us back to madness, doesn't it? Which is certainly part of this family. Yeah. Yeah. I, know, I, I thought it was interesting, you know, he had, there's this dichotomy between his pride and his own lineage, and I, is there some fear of, of that being corrupted at some, at some point in his past or something like that? That maybe that, that's where all this horror is being drawn from? Because, you know, it's uh, going over his work, it's clear, you know, being an Anglophile and being very proud and wanting to be uh, 18th, 19th century, you know, uh, noble or something like that, um, that he's proud of his heritage, but then maybe in the crossing over I, I, he, to America, or I, I guess he, he knew pretty much his lineage pretty well, but it's interesting that he had so much pride in this, and then there's, you know, all these characters and all these stories are about people who have had these their lineages corrupted at some point in the past, or were corrupted to begin with, and um, yeah, I don't know. No, no, I think that you're right on. I mean, I think anybody who, um, I mean, for lack of a better word, is kind of a bigot, is always worried that they're secretly the thing that they're bigoted against. Yeah, you know? yeah. When a bully's on the playground, like, sure, you guys are all gay, you know. Hmm, what's really bothering that guy? <laughs> you know? You know, I had something like that happen in my own family a little bit, in that, you know, my relative of mine I know, who happens to have a certain degree of racism in his heart, I love him dearly, that's just sure. his period of time, yeah. but I actually had my genealogy done, genetically. Mm -hmm. And there's about 12% from Africa, yeah. which I was delighted to tell that relative of mine. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and I guess the point is uh, going far above back 100% from Africa, which I guess is uh, sure. sort of the some of the horror coming from, for yeah. him at least. Yeah, yeah. for him. Now, now, Mark, you brought up uh, Fritz Leiber, uh, and he's one of the guys that corresponded with Lovecraft and was definitely influenced by Lovecraft's work. Uh, you know, and well, Howard and Robert Bloch and all of these other authors that were directly influenced, you know, that communicated with him. Right. Uh, what do you think it was about Lovecraft's work that got their motors running? Again, I think it's the vast unknowing cosmos. Um, the Lovecraft documentary talks about this a lot, and I, I really recommend it for people who haven't seen it. The recent Fear, Fear yes. of the Unknown. Fear of the Unknown. Yeah. Um, oh, Patrick, could you, uh, when you're typing, Patrick, could you mute? My bad. Well, no problem. No problem. So, I like it, it, man. It makes us feel. It makes me feel like we're in a newsroom. Plus, with Mark's little uh, crawl on the bottom of the screen, <laughs> this is some CNN level sh shit going on here. I like it. <laughs> Emphasis on the shit. Anyway, uh, a bovine extraction, sir, a bovine extraction. What I was going to say is that I think with Liber in particular, a really wonderful novel of his is called Our Lady of Darkness. And you'll notice that the person who wrote the book, The Secret History, again, a theme that runs through Lovecraft, where there's something that most people don't know about that's behind everything. And in Our Lady of Darkness, guess what the name of the author of this book is that's so bad? Castro. Oh, really? A name from Lovecraft's past, when you think about it. So that's a kind of a tip of the hat, which right. they like doing to one another, I think. But the idea was, and it's set in San Francisco, it's a wonderful novel from the late 60s. And the idea is, is that there are unknowable elements to the building of cities that create these entities mm -hmm. and these powers. And, and I, I, I'm not going to misstate the name, but this idea of being able to predict the future or control the present through understanding the structure of cities. That sounds dead boring, but it's a fascinating novel. Now, it does have a little bit of wish fulfillment with the much older guy and the much younger woman, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Uh -huh. But I, I'd, I've seen lots of authors do that. It's really worth your time. And again, the idea of a cosmic unknowingness that we're just getting a piece of, and it's not that we have any control or power over it, but we didn't know about it before, and now we knew. Mm -hmm. you know after such knowledge, what forgiveness? Elliot, right? That's what we're dealing with. And I think that appealed to a lot of people. 
There are also people of the period who really liked Lovecraft's kind of schlockier elements, as in Herbert West Reanimator. I think Robert Block loved that. Mm. And you can see a lot of that kind of fun in there. But it's the serious stuff, I, I think, is the unknowing cosmos. And again, that takes you back to rationalism where you don't believe in a cosmic daddy to take care of things. Right. Uh, Patrick? Yeah, um, I think that's getting to the heart of the matter, and, and like uh, um, Chris was saying, I guess, uh, you know, there, a lot of, like you were just saying, a lot of it comes back to the rationalism, you know, uh, for people who don't have an interest in mythology or gods or things like that and aren't really worried about that sort of thing, where do they get they're scared, and more importantly, what are they actually scared of? And uh, you know, what sets him apart, I guess, from other authors and from horror of the past, I guess, is this fascination with um, you know, this you know, what's truly horrible is the reality of the world we live in. You know, there there isn't anyone looking out for you. There's no patron, and you know, there's just um, all, we're, we're getting a bigger glimpse of what all the terrible things that are out there in the universe, you know, space is huge, there's there's so much out there that we don't understand, and all that being captured in a way that can be, you know, um, expressed to anyone and, you know, be experienced by anyone, even those without, at his time or even now, that much of an understanding of uh, what, what, the, what the universe is actually like. Pfeiffer? Uh... Well, in terms of what I think these guys, I mean, those are conceptually, I think that's what was is so interesting about H.P. Lovecraft, and I think it's, um, I think for so many folks, he was the first one to introduce those ideas to them, even though those ideas were maybe out there already. When I think of Lovecraft <clears throat> in a lot of different respects about his influence on people, I think of it in terms of music and how that influences people, yeah. because, uh, and maybe to use a a recent example of an artist, Lou Reed, for example. Nobody sounds like Lou Reed. He's not particularly a good singer. In fact, I, I, he even sounds a little tone deaf when he's delivering a song. But Velvet Underground, when it came out, people were used to hearing pop music and things that were about love and that sort of thing. And There were songs and there was music out there that addressed drugs and that addressed sex and that addressed life in the city. But maybe this was the first band for a lot of folks that really synthesized all those ideas for them in a, you know, a couple of albums and the voice is so unique, it's almost bad, but you still like it. And I feel that way about Lovecraft a lot because he's so overwritten, and there are elements of what he does that are, I mean, you know, they're kind of bad. If You wouldn't teach a lot of the things that he does, the same way you wouldn't teach you know, to sing like Lou Reed. And the, but yet it still is a, you, immediately unique and immediately identifiable. And the other thing about it, I think that if you can, if you can take those ideas that, Lou Reed sang about and run with them, you can have a very successful rock career. But if you ever spend your time trying to imitate this guy, everybody's going to hate you. And I feel like that is the exact same uh, with with H.P. Lovecraft. Um, I love it when artists take his ideas and continue to grow them, but whenever anybody sits down to do... Maybe the only uh, exclusion would be early Ramsey Campbell because he does such a good job of it. But you know, to actually sit and write in Lovecraft's language... No, nobody likes that. <laughs> At least I don't. Do, do you guys disagree with me? Well, now, purple you... doesn't age well. I guess purple prose is, is probably one of the biggest drawbacks to having to go through stuff, I guess, his works. Hmm. Well, how do you feel about August Derelitz stuff? Well, I don't <laughs> like it, <laughs> uh, to be honest. I mean, yeah. I, I have an appreciation yeah. for the guy and, and for what he did, but it doesn't yeah. mean I have to like his writing. And Yeah, it's... No. it's and I think it's Matt, we've talked about this on the show before, and I'm not the only one. I unfortunately got a book that said H.P. Lovecraft on it, and it was an August Gerlach book. So that was very confusing. No, I think you're, and you, you hit the nail exactly on the head. I mean, I think that writing, and anybody who's written, and I think all of us here have written things. When, when you write from what you feel, even if it's for commercial reasons, it's genuine by its nature. If you're imitating someone else, I don't think it is. Right. And I think that fools very few people. Now, some people might not care. I, I, I can promise you that Fifty Shades of Grey pastiches or Twilight, and by the way, if you haven't seen honest trailers making fun of movies, I really recommend that. They do a great job on Twilight. Anyway, <laughs> you could probably get people writing follow-ups to Twilight, very much like fanfic or slash fic, that, that people would, would still like because they're so in love with the ideas. But that would be an extremely narrow group of people doing that. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, that's, well, you, actually, that's what happened both with Twilight and Fifty Shades of Grey. They were they were fan fiction. Yeah. Hmm. They they were just that there was stuff that was online, and somehow they got a following, and then a, one of the publishers read some of the fan fiction because their friend uh, sent it their way, and then they said, "Oh, well, you know, you should write a book," and then they did, and it's there's something really amateurish about both of those books. I, I've only I've only started to read uh, Twilight, and I couldn't deal with it. And, <laughs> two two and things, I, Chris. Promise yeah. me, when we're done, you'll check oh. out Honest Trailers on their their review of Twilight. You must see oh, it. Oh right, right. I've it. seen it. It's it's pretty good. Yeah, uh, and 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 the second thing I would say is 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 that you know you can find this kind of stuff everywhere. And, 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 and you're right about it, but, you know, we got to look for things that are original where we can find it. I don't mind a, a tip of the hat to somebody, but you got to, like, do a little heavy lifting as you're right. It's yeah. Not, well, I mean, I guess the reason I even bring up those kinds of things is just to, to, to build on the idea of Lovecraft's influence. He's such a unique writer, and the uniqueness comes from his unique background and his unique worldview, and it's hard to replicate that. And uh, it's probably why we continue to go back to this guy, who's been dead for uh, so long, rather than one of his successors. I mean, obviously, there are plenty of authors who are materially successful who write in the horror genre. But, I mean, King, uh, uh, Lovecraft is still the master of this, un this, this unique voice. I mean, he's the, he's the one that's got it. I mean, so, I, yeah, I like the, the, the bit about, you know, music, I guess. It's like a sort of a brush of fresh air, I guess, for, for some kids growing up, if you were a little bit sheltered, you know. You were you were listening to the Beach Boys or childhood things, and then for the first time you you, you see something that's negative, that's something you know the uh, a book or you know something like that that made you think about things differently, and it's 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 that sort of experience when you're re reading Lovecraft. I mean, it's like you have all these uh, you know you're used to monsters and stuff, but there's more about you know what's what's going on behind people that there's there's some sort of terrible. Uh, curse or thing going on and that's entwined with you know uh, every, there, you know there's no hero there's just uh, uh, unfortunate people in an unfortunate universe yeah I mean I think it's he's unique in terms of subject matter and he's unique in terms of voice and this is why he, he cracks people's skulls up I mean you know the biggest complaint I get is well he doesn't really develop plot and he doesn't have characters and there's no women and there's all these sorts of things. And yeah, I don't care. There's plenty of other writers who take care of those things, but nobody sounds like this. The same way people would say, Sex Pistols are terrible. You know, they, they, the singer's bad and they're bad to look at. And, and I say, yeah, but nobody sounds like them. And they're singing songs about abortion and they're singing songs about, you know, anarchy and things that I just, I hadn't heard before. And I think that Lovecraft serves very much the same. That's why so many musicians are attracted to him and wind up to, you know, kind of taking it into their own, into their own genres, just like writers do. And I think this is where Chris is steering the, the conversation eventually is, you know, wh where are we seeing Lovecraft's influence now and how is it working itself in all sorts of different mediums of art now, and I think the people are taking those themes that were introduced to them by this very unique voice, and then they're adding their own unique voice to it. Chris, you were going to go around that That's way. That's exactly eventually. where I was going to go with it. I mean, you basically said it. I, I, cinema is one of the more interesting things. I think, uh, you know, Guillermo del Toro is this uh, filmmaker who was going to do an adaptation of At the Mountains of Madness, still might, but his connection to Lovecraft, I mean, he adapted the uh, Hellboy graphic novel, which was also influenced by Lovecraft. Very much. So there's like you're coming. He's coming at it from from two different sides, and there's all of these sort of seeds of Lovecraft that's all over. It's in comic books. It's in it's in visual art. It's in films and cinema, and also in other people's writings. And uh, it, I feel like, and we've been saying this for a while. It seems like he's really starting to come out and become much more popular. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, but where are we? <laughs> Patrick. <laughs> Patrick. You still hearing me? Yeah, yeah what's up? Yeah. I'm no, so sorry. <laughs> well, I'm just trying to keep this note in my mind. I like the, you know, there, there's this sort of ability to take. Uh, I just watched Hellboy again recently. I happened to have watched that recently. And, you know, it's so great that they, they folded the story of Rasputin into this, because Rasputin is a really fun, you know, sort of character, and he's just perfect for adaptation to this, and just like they mentioned in the movie, he was actually, 
they gave him a banquet full of cyanide. They shot him. They killed him. They stabbed mm-hmm. him. They drowned him. And you know, the, and there's this, you know, the story goes that he, you know, they after they drowned him, this they, they saw that the coffin they put him in was, you know, at scratch marks, and he was still alive when they put him down there. So that there. There's the element of Lovecraft that you can just sort of work in any sort of historical detail that you want to, and, and you know if it's got a history and if it's got a little bit of horror to it, you can just work that in, and that's that uh, you know you can see that in all of GDT's you know stuff, Guillermo's um, movies. That you know you've seen Pan Labyrinth, Pan's Labyrinth, and he seems to want to handle stuff that has a little bit of that. There's um, uh, Pacific Rim, which is the big, you know, blockbuster that came out recently. But you know, there, there's still stuff like that. You know, there's this international portal, but and then this also happened in the past, and uh, maybe that was a little bit uh, iffy that the dinosaurs were really genetically modified uh, aliens from outer space. But uh, um, it's still a fun thought, and it's and it's a bit Lovecraftian in the way. You know, there's there's this horrible uh, past to this universe, and you know, we're just on the brink of destruction. Do, do you remember in Men in Black, the great Rip Torn made this comment at one point that there was always something horrible happening, and it was their job to keep everybody else from finding out what it was. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of, the, the again, the idea of a vast, uncaring universe, and it's important because when people read HPL, they often think that it's kind of directed badly toward us, and actually we're like ants. They don't care. You know, yeah. they really don't. And, and so what's interesting when people write about it, you can see the struggle because they want to make it more accessible to people so people become more important, which is antithetical to the idea of this vast, uncaring universe. Yeah. Takes us back to Charlie Strauss's stuff, which, again, I highly recommend. Or, for that matter, Tim Powers wrote a great book called Declare on this kind of topic. When you find out the Cold War was all about what we would call magic, which really isn't magic. What is it? Pardon me? What, what, what is it if it's not magic? What is it? It's aliens that can do things that we can't understand. And like okay. Arthur C. Clarke used to say, technology sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable from magic to us. Right. I and mean, that's a, yeah, that's I another thing that's... I'm sorry. No, that's a, you're also talking about the atrocity archives, uh, the, um, the laundry stuff that Charles Strauss does. That's... That's sort of why it seems like magic, but really it's this very complicated science and technology that's going on. It is. And I love the, what did they call the zombies? They, they called them what, post-mortem security or something like that? It's, right. it's, it's really nicely done. And, uh, and again, I think he took the, the, the very good ideas of HPL and he put it in a more modern sense. Uh, I think Powers did the same thing, but he did it in a more literary sense. Um, and, 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 and I really like seeing that. Um, really means a lot to me. And it's good to see it in, 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 modern, in modern parlance. Because during the, I guess, 60s and 70s, there were a lot of people who wrote really schlocky HPL stuff. Um, and, and, and that's not a lot of fun to read. We talked about some of it, like Derelict's, Derelict's work. And, mm-hmm. and even though I love Henry Kuttner, some of his stuff, you know, didn't really touch me real deeply. Of course, on the other hand, I, you know, uh, Herbert West reanimator. Wow, right? <clears throat> yeah. But I think he meant that as a joke. So he did. He did. I mean, I, well, know, I, mean, think, I, I, I think I don't want to come off the wrong way. If we're t- I'm talking about people writing in Lovecraft's style. Like, I mean, there's nothing wrong with doing it. I've done it. You know, it's a, it's 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 just like to bring it back to music. You know, uh, the Ramones would be another example of a band that's a very simplistic uh, band, but nobody sounds like them and. You know, when I first started learning to play guitar, I lo- would love to throw on their records, and I would learn the whole thing front to back. And I think that that's, uh, referencing Ramsey Campbell earlier, if you look at his canon of work, he slowly drifts away from the Lovecraft influence, and you start hearing his own voice and his own childhood in there, right? So if you read the stuff, you know, from early in his career, it's definitely, I mean, the characters are named Armitage, and they're, I mean, he just pulls in everything from uh, Lovecraft's work, but eventually we get to a place where you really find out about what was going on that was unique to him. So everybody's got to go through the training wheels phase where we rely on our authors, including Stephen King and, and Clive Barker and these guys who, who definitely wrote in Lovecraft style early on, but then gradually make it your own. And in terms of Lovecraft's literary influence, meaning what uh, what I take that to mean is his stories, his fiction, not necessarily the ideas or characters as presented later, but those specific stories, how did they influence other people? I always love to see it in a way that's not totally 
predictable. Obviously, it's fun to see little references to that stuff uh, in movies and on television. Like in Fringe, they're always making little Lovecraft references. Or um, I just watched the Scooby-Doo uh, Mystery Incorporated episode with Hatecraft with, you know, Jeffrey Combs doing the voice. And that yeah, was there's, hilarious. There's a couple of cartoons that have done, they've done Lovecraft episodes. There's like the Ghostbusters one. Right. And then there's there's a if you ever watched Billy and Mandy, I don't know it might be yeah. out of your range, but there's a yep, collect, yep. Call, collect call of the Cthulhu episode, yeah. and they they it's funny is they take everything like really literally like you can't look directly at Cthulhu or you go mad, so you look at him through a mirror, uh, you know, so you don't look directly at him. <laughs> like he's a basilisk or something, but uh, yeah, <laughs> I think that. That at the Mountains of Madness episode was really interesting, where Guillermo del Toro was trying to, you know, a little bit publicly trying to get people into this and trying to get, I guess, executives or whatever to buy into the show or something like that. But um, I mean, what would it take to have a legitimate, uh, good Lovecraft adaptation hit the big screen? You know, really make it big, and it sort of go into the pantheon of, of, of you know big authors that, that, that were successfully adapted into movies and things like that. Because we've, we, uh, we've had a couple good ones so far. You know, there's the, the black and white films with, um, uh, I think, Chad, yourself, you were the, uh, in the Call of Cthulhu one as well. Yep, Chris, yeah. too. But, you know, I, I guess, see, I, I guess what I'm driving at is I wish Lovecraft's, I like to see Lovecraft's influence get developed in different ways, and I don't think he's... Uh, I think he's written some stories that definitely are ready to be adapted for cinema, but for the most part, I think he's meant to be enjoyed as a writer. And I appreciate it when people make movies, and we've already talked about this because we had a cinema roundtable, but right. you know, movies like The Thing, or um, yeah, there are a lot of horror movies, or The Burrowers, I think was even mentioned, which has a Lovecraftian influence. I, I like it when the elements and the themes are taken and put in cinematic language. I don't necessarily think we need a big screen. I'm in my, the minority in this, but... Uh, you know, read the stories. Do we really need a movie of some of this stuff? I don't know. <laughs> yes, yes, we do. <laughs> well, I mean, if if you're not careful, I mean, it turns into Pacific Rim, which is very loud, right? And yeah. Yeah. Big. yeah, I think that's the big fear is the the corrupting influence of Hollywood. You know, they want to make everything a big, you know, sexy Hollywood explosion film. Uh, so. Well, okay, you can call that the corrupting of influence of Hollywood. I <laughs> I call that people voting with their dollar. Uh, sure. That's what people want to see. Yeah. And the box office tells us this week after week after week. So I, I have a hard time getting on executives' backs for producing things that people already well, want and have asked mean, for. This, I mean, this kind of uh, dovetails into my to my last question: is what, why isn't Lovecraft's work uh, more mainstream? What about is about what he does? What these ideas? I mean, maybe they were ahead of his time and that wasn't as popular. It was relegated to these uh, weird fiction magazines. But he is becoming more popular now, and it could probably be argued that more people read Lovecraft now than have ever in any period of time, and uh, that maybe our culture and our society is changing and more people are open to these types of ideas. But what, what do you think, you know, why is he still kind of this niche author? Well, see, I, I would disagree. I, I don't think. I mean, I think his fiction certainly is, but the ideas that he talked about have leaked into... I don't want to say the zeitgeist necessarily, but leaked into popular culture. I put a, a link up to a, a fake ad for Cthulhu Lego, uh, for example. Yeah. I have a Christmas tree ornament of Cthulhu, you know, that kind of stuff. Appropriate. The people that I, yeah, cthulhu uh, I I know people who will look at the idol I have that my brother got me of Cthulhu, and they'll say, oh, you read HPL too. Yeah. And we're not in the tentacle closet anymore, is the point. Yeah. I'd say we're, we're very close to hitting that critical mass where he's yeah. just sort of pretty much everywhere, just one of those authors you have to know, like Poe or something like that, who's, who's the, I guess, would be the other person you would, you would compare him to, I guess, in terms of how he came back. And I, I, would, I would actually dovetail with that and say that just as Poe's language can be exclusionary to the modern sensibility, which is the criticism that's leveled at, at HPL, same thing for Shakespeare. How many themes of Shakespeare do we see? I am not likening Shakespeare to HPL. Don't, don't worry about that. But what I am saying is a lot of the ideas of HPL are in popular literature. Cthulhu Ski Masks. I've seen that from lots of people, and they weren't all bought from uh, Andrew Lehman's friends either. I, I mean, the point is it's kind of leaked in. And, and, uh, but as far as what keeps 
people from reading it. It's the language. And, you know, when you have Joyce Carol Oates give a, a, big, uh, a big hurrah to HPL, I mean, it's starting to get in there as, as far as what the, the, the literary types. I mean, I have a friend who teaches Gothic literature here, and I kind of, you know, talked her into in, including HPL because I think she should. Um, what is she? And, what, and it's good. Well, may I, interrupt. What does she think of if she was a professor? And did she know of his work before? Yeah. And and she wasn't teaching it. Well, she pretty much focused on Poe uh -huh. and and Shelley and and, and for Gothic fiction. Sure, and sure. I recommended that she put. And she said that's a little two twenties. And I said, oh, let's yeah. not go there, right? Uh -huh. And I, I had to threaten to go give a guest lecture, and that made her think maybe I should, maybe she should do it herself, and that's a good idea, right? Sure. Yeah, there's a there's a couple of good. I I don't know about good, but there's a couple of gothic pieces that The Alchemist comes to mind mostly for for Lovecraft, I guess. Um, just I don't know if. Uh, sorry, I was going to say. I think <laughs> any of those Poe pastiches are are good for the gothic. Tradition, but um, in what we were discussing about uh, why isn't it? I, <clears throat> you know, Mark, I think you're right. It's definitely the concepts, or at least the monsters, are in the mainstream. I think people have heard of these words, Shoggoth and Cthulhu, and they're being marketed through all sorts of different channels. Um, but I do think that there's still sort of a club that you get into when you start reading the fiction that's a little less, you know, mainstream. And and for me, I always felt that there's sort of people with their literature and their entertainment that they consume, there is a subconscious, it's, it's waking dreaming in a way, you know, like our dreams are sort of working out themes of our lives, and in the same respect, the entertainment we uh, look for works out certain things in our lives, even popcorn entertainment we might not think of that way, and as such, there's almost like a hierarchy of needs that get addressed when people go to consume a book or a comic or a movie, and I think that the the primal needs need to be met first: love, security, uh, safety, these sort of things. And so most of the things that are mass popular are about those themes: keeping a family together, keeping yourself safe, and falling in love and reproducing are the things that people are always going to go after because they're primal, very primal needs. Whereas Lovecraft is working a little above that, where those needs are met, and now we can start thinking about our place in the universe and uh, what it means to be a human being. So those those themes are a little... You can get to them once the other things have been met, you know? So I don't think it's ever going to be mainstream in that respect. It's just not about the things that are at the core of what all humans share. I would say even something like Fifty Shades of Grey is. It's about reproductive themes, right? You're not going to find that in, in, in Lovecraft. No. But, but, no you but, but as you were saying it, I was kind of making a joke to myself. You, you know, isn't, isn't that what... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm on screen, so I'm having trouble remembering. Um, but but that the, the, but we've seen a lot of HBL thing about reproducing from outside. Wilbur Watley, the Watley family, they were trying to reproduce, right? They were, but that's not the kind that I think people are. Uh... <laughs> I don't think that's what people are looking for. That chess reference. No, but they wanna, yeah. what, was know, there not media. was there what? not recently a movie, and it was a pretty schlocky one, <laughs> that was a a mis a mis telling of of of. Uh, Shadow over Innsmouth, family in the Northwest where they apparently finish their life cycle in the ocean and the kid finds out that he's related to them and doesn't want to. I, I don't even know if they paid rights for any of that stuff. Huh. But, but that was kind of what you're talking about, where you know they, they take these more primal needs, the more accessible needs maybe to the viewing public, and then they overlay this other stuff onto it. I'm, I'm trying to think of the name of it. It was pretty schlocky. That sounds interesting, though. But... Uh... <laughs> I should look into that. But maybe to to Pfeiffer's point, it's it, that the reason why it hasn't hit mainstream, and I'm just rephrasing what what you said, Chad, is that maybe it's because Lovecraft's ideas deal primarily with things that don't appeal to most people. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just thinking of like art films and stuff like that. Just people, they want to see certain things. Uh, I think another stumbling block for some people who might be interested in Lovecraft but aren't really getting into it is um, sort of the association with sci-fi, I guess. You know, there's some people who just, I, I remember uh, some older person saying she was interested in, in Lovecraft, but, you know, there's all these alien names and all these places she doesn't understand, and she, she you know, 
it, to, to them, I guess, and that may be just a generational thing, that it was just kind of a word salad for them, uh, for some of the things that, that they were getting into. They didn't really understand what was going on. Uh, that's partly the addiction, uh, you know, purple prose problem, and partly, I guess, uh, you know, the interest in the fantastical, I guess, that maybe it's not shared by everyone. Well, it, it's interesting that many people, and I'm, I'm a big propeller head about science fiction from way back, but it's interesting how people say things like they don't like science fiction, and then I'll find out they're reading things that certainly do have science fictional elements, just not marketed that way. And that's because the genre fiction is thought as being exclusionary. You're one of the club, right? And, and so in, in that regard, I think that what we need are, you know, people like Oprah and her book club. <laughs> I'm just trying to imagine what that would be like. Well, hey, you know, I actually think if Oprah came out with the Necronomicon, the, I, and I, by that I mean the, because uh, I think she probably, if anybody owns an actual Necronomicon, it's Oprah. <laughs> but uh, if she came out with a big collection of Lovecraft stories and asked young people to be reading them, I think that would be, Brilliant. Yeah. When I say I don't think it's something that's going to pass over into the mainstream, that's just my cynicism. But um, in a lot of respects, I think it's a perfect educational tool. The stories, specifically the stories of H.P. Lovecraft, and I say that because you are faced at some point in your reading career with dealing with difficult language that is not of your time, right? So it's very important that no matter what it is that you get through it and you're actually learning how to decode texts with whatever it is. For a lot of us it's Shakespeare the first time we come across Shakespeare it's very difficult but when you read you know King Henry the fourth the first time what is it you're getting to by getting through that text other than a history and a love story things that aren't necessarily interesting to people who are 13, 14, 15. What they are interested in is murder, death, monsters, chaos, and these things which you get delivered by, you know, it's a reward for pushing your way through all that purple prose and pushing your way oh, yeah. through all that text. You're rewarded with a lot of blood and guts. And that's what kids like from a very yeah. young age. I mean, small children are, are interested in, the. if you look at fairy tales, what's interesting about them is because they have chaotic evil at the center of them. And most of the time, you know, these are things that get kids reading. So I think there's a, there's a, great dual function in Lovecraft and that it's very rewarding for an adolescent mind because it's about some uh, horrific themes and then also it takes some reading and rereading to decode those sentences which is an invaluable skill that you'll use for the rest of your life uh, as a reader so uh, you know I do wish it was it was being put out there more I thought that the stories of Ray Bradbury were excellent for people to read at those age but and I'm a he's my favorite guy but he's such a good writer it's just passing from the page to your brain it's good to have that little uh, uh, curtain yeah. that you have to kind of wrestle with to get to all that, the theme. That was my experience, and I think I talked about it on the show uh, at some point, but when I first started reading Lovecraft, I had to sit down with a dictionary next to me, because mm -hmm. there were so many words that he used that I didn't know what they meant. Sometimes I'd skip over them if you get the gist of them, but it's like, Squamous? What, what is Squamous? You know, like, just uh, so many of those. And I was, you know, young. I was 13 years old or, or something like that. But there was, like what Chad was saying, there's that reward. Like I felt like I was a character in a Lovecraft story going over a tome and deciphering it. And by deciphering what goes on in this tome, I'm getting all this cool information about this world, this fictional world, however. Well, it's not the real world, but it's this fictional world. Ah, but here's the thing. It is the real world. See, I was going to say that's the difference between when I would read through Tolkien at a young age, and it would be all this elvish and stuff, I'd go, that, these things aren't real anyway, so I had no problem skipping over a five-page song, or, or any science fiction that I read where it would be all of these convoluted, and Lovecraft does this sometimes as well, but it would be made up stuff that I didn't actually need to know. But because Lovecraft sets his stories in the real world, you do need to look up what squamous is, because squamous is an actual word. Right. You're right. You're right. Eldritch yeah, okay. is an actual word. And this yeah. is actual language that you can, probably shouldn't at that age, but you could if you wanted to, employ <laughs> into your own daily conversation and it would make sense. So in that respect, you know, he, he's got things situated in a world that you know. Yeah, that's, that, that's another appeal, I guess, is, is to, and why it would be great, you know, if we start including it more in curriculums, I guess, stuff like Call of the Cthulhu, is that, you know, there, there's this sort of veneer of legitimacy to everything that's going on. You know, you know, when, I, when I first read Call of Cthulhu, I wanted to look through, like, old newspapers and figure out, you know, was that article really there where, like, there was this earthquake on that day in uh, 1936 or whatever, you know, uh, you know, was, was there any account of that sort of thing? It just feels like you could you could go back and look through stuff and maybe figure this whole thing out and maybe uh, uh, get captured in it as well. I think that's, that's another great appeal of, uh, 
uh, I had this the more ar- investigative stuff. I'm sorry. I, I had this argument with my high school English teacher, and, and, and she was forcing us to read E.M. Forster, and, and especially that bit of a passage to India called the Malabar Caves, and I wrote a long essay about how it was a metaphor for how boring the fiction was. <laughs> and um, I started saying, well, you know, have, have you read any of HPL stuff? Because when I was very young, my brother, mad props, Jack, my brother made me read this stuff when I was very, very young, eight and nine years old. And then he would explain things to me, what the words meant, take me to the dictionary. It was very useful to me. And so when my teacher says, hey, you've got to work through Shakespeare, you've got to work through Poe, which have some difficult portions to it, um, you know, I said, well, how is HPL any different? And it isn't. And that's exactly what Chad's saying. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, I, mean, I had the worst time with uh, Emerson and Thoreau getting through that stuff. Uh, and, I, and to what end? At the end of it, I, I mean, somebody's going to get mad at me about that. Later on in life, I came to appreciate those authors, but I remember in high school trying to get through that stuff and not understanding even what the point was. Okay, go live in a cabin. Big deal. You know? <laughs> if there had been aliens out stalking the cabin, then maybe I would have uh, come away with something. If you were yeah, just was... a giant, tacticular, rugose cone, you'd be okay. <laughs> That's right. I felt the same. Weathering Heights, man, I read that, and I just was like, "What? who gives a shit, man. These guys are assholes. All of them. <laughs> Have you guys seen Jane Austen Fight Club, that video? No. <laughs> you need to look it up. Jane Austen's Fight Club. And I mean, and what's funny about it, it's scene for scene out of Fight Club. And mm. and I just love that. I oh, really... Check it out. Well, I, I, unfortunately, i got to wrap things up. Uh, we're, we're out of time here. We've gone over again, as we always do yeah. with these things. Um, but is there any last thoughts that any, that any of you have? Uh, I'll ask you, Mark, first. Oh, I think HPL uh, really defines how we look at our place in the universe and how we look at our own ancestry and how we kind of engage the universe as, you know, being very small in this very vast universe, which I think is a wonderful thing but can also be scary. And it's that essential tension that I like to see kind of leaking into everyday uh, social media. Uh, Patrick? I think Lovecraft is going to have, uh, you know, a lot of influence on coming things. You know, there's there's this sort of like two tracks of mind when it comes to modern science and technology and things like that. There's people who are hopeful about it, you know, have have every expectation of going to space and you know having greater lives, greater life expectancy and stuff like that. And then and I guess maybe it was missing from science fiction at the time or or you know just just general thought at the time. You know, there there are some horrible implications about what's going on out there, you know, we have to, for him, it was sort of a doom and gloom kind of thing, maybe a little bit more than it is for us, but it's instructive in terms of how we can think about the future and, you know, the potential for humankind and what dangers we ought to look out for in terms of uh, uh, maybe a Cthulhu out there. <laughs> no! <laughs> the, stars right. last... what? the stars are right. The yeah. stars are right. Chad, any last thoughts? Uh, not too much. The only thing I would say, I've been relating Lovecraft to a lot of pop figures, and I think the one thing about him that, um, in terms of his influence and about him as a writer, that uh, he is a writer that continues to influence folks, is that is his uniqueness. There's nobody else like him, but his 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 uniqueness is not exclusionary. Uh, if you think of somebody like Andy Warhol, who redefine the art world, but the very nature of Warhol was that you couldn't be a part of the club unless you were a special sexy few. And that was part of the reason that people are still interested in this guy, is because they kind of wish they could be a part of that club. Whereas Lovecraft was an incredibly unique guy who changed horror literature and science fiction literature and asked everybody to come along with him. It was in the nature of the man, and this is something that we know about him. And so I think as a, as an influence his very uh, collegial attitude, his, his way that he invited other people in continues to live with him. And I think it's, it's, it's interesting that just the guy's good nature is part of the reason that I think he continues to be an influence. That's just something I wanted to mention earlier that I forgot about. Great. Well, thank you guys so much. You have been involved in the H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast roundtable discussion of Lovecraft's influence in literature and cinema and music. Uh, and I want to thank you all for participating. I'm Chris Lackey. 
Thank you very I'm much. Chad Pfeiffer. Uh, thank you, Mark and Patrick. And I also wanted to say Johnny and Kevin will get you on at another time. Sorry you couldn't make it today. All right. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Thank you. And...